Well, I'm so vulnerable. I'm feeling so friggin' vulnerable right about now. <laughs> and we love vulnerable around here. So, a couple of things. Um, man, that was fabulous. I mean, that was so terrific. I mean, it's so great at TED how uh, you go back and forth from from technology that's like new and on the edge and technology that's ancient and sort of reaches inside you and grabs you and that's what's so special about this conference which a uh, Russian cabbie told me on the way from the airport said oh yes people from TED yes they know everything they tip nothing <laughs> I also have child who juggles with the ping pong balls. He has no lips. <laughs> so, just think of me as kind of a garden weasel up here next to these things here. <clears throat> James Truman, of course, the arbiter of uh, trends and pseudo trends. I mean, I, I do sit in a chair. Does this work? <laughs> is, is this a thing? Is this happening? Is this... Uh... I mean, this conference is so fantastic. Yesterday, you know, we all witnessed um, Joy talking about how we haven't actually even begun to figure out the technology of the complexity of computers interacting. And then Kurzweil gets up and says, you know, nanobots, we're going to inject them into you, and they're going to be on a wireless uh, local area network, so that'll be fine. <laughs> that was minutes later, and then, of course, he says the next 100 years are going to be like 24,000 years, so Hillis is freaking out, you know, he's got to <laughs> recalibrate the whole friggin' clock. And you know, if Bran Farron doesn't have any disposable income, it's his own damn fault, I said. <clears throat> I'm not going to feel sorry for him. Oh, it's so great to be back here. As Hazel Miller said in her opening uh, lyrics, so many have died here on this stage. Um, <clears throat> and the courage of Norman Lear, right? He, he's, he's raised to know this prayer you know, God help me to always seek the truth and spare me from people who appear to know it. Um, and he comes here, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> I love TED because it actually um, simulates or emulates or I don't know, it's kind of a download sort of thing of two modes of content that I know pretty well. Probably all of us know at least one of them pretty well. The, the first is a telethon. You know, Ted is kind of like a telethon uh, to me. It's your Jerry Lewis over here, right? <laughs> and there's always some sort of expectation of a surprise guest who will show up, you know, kind of like Dean Martin used to. He arrives late. That's Nicholas Negroponte, of course, you know. Shows up, has to go somewhere immediately, you know. Um, <laughs> it's like a telethon. Of course, Ted doesn't have a, a tote board. Ricky has a tote board. Uh, Ted. The conference doesn't have a tote board, but there is this sense, and I think it's legitimate, it's real, it's not a joke, that we gather here to find a cure for something, to seek a cure for something, and the, uh, we're seeking a cure, I think, for success. There's something that appears to be missing, there's something that doesn't, isn't quite complete. We, we seek a cure, and so many of the themes that people talk about are how are we going to fix this? How are we going to fix this sense of incompleteness that comes with our success? Um, not that I have any answers, uh, particularly, but, but I do want to talk about how the solutions to so many of the problems that we talk about here, particularly the spiritual humanitarian solutions to so many of the problems we talk about here, are so close to home. They're so close to the synapses, I think, that produce the extraordinary technology that, uh, that, that we all celebrate here, that we all are mesmerized by, that we are, we are amazed by, that we mistrust. Um, any volunteers for the nanobots, by the way, in this audience? <laughs> I do have an idea for Zoe Baird, though. I think this is the winner. 
really. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not Metamucil, it's Betamucil. <laughs> and two, two tablespoons of this and the nanobots are out of your system. <laughs> So let's, let's talk about, you know, the other thing that this is like is college orientation. I mean, because we're sort of orienting ourselves to the future at TED and holding a telethon that is, attempts to fix something that we don't know exactly what the problem is. And so I get back to this notion of technology that is deeply rooted in us, technology that moves us, that, that, that it represents a certain kind of magic and extraordinary change that that maybe we don't completely have a handle on, but it drives us, it moves us. Let's uh, talk about two speakers who were here. Um, uh, Nigel, in the very beginning on, on day one, who talked about the long jump and about the, how this space here represents the Olympic long jump record right now. But do you know the real story of the long jump? How in Mexico City in the 1960s, Bob Beeman broke that record by sailing through the previous record two feet. He broke the record by two feet. It's a feat that's never been duplicated in Olympic history, certainly in a modern Olympic history, where somebody breaks a record in an utterly unearthly way. Bob Beeman himself did not understand what had happened when he blasted through that record by two feet. But in the intervening years since the 60s, of course, the athletes move up incrementally to try to, to take that record. To, uh, by quarters of an inch, by an inch, it would go up and then it would go back and it would go up and finally Carl Lewis and uh, an athlete who I can't remember broke the record in the 90s and Bob Beeman's record was gone. But we have there the forces that really, I think, shape a ma uh, you know, world culture, human culture regarding technology. That force of magic, that force of blasting through two feet of a record and not knowing why, but having to live with the result, live with the consequence. Do any of you know that Bob Beeman never, ever came close to the record again? He never even broke his own previous personal best by six inches. It happened once and it was gone. And the world lived with the consequences. And that other force, that incremental sense of we're, we're, we're moving a little bit faster, we're moving a little bit farther, we're, we're marshalling the, the massive force of everyone together focused on that goal, and by God, we're going to beat it, and we do. Which is a real record. Which is a team effort. Which is, what do either of these phenomena mean? Yet technology is full of both of them. I don't want to mention anything about Y2K because we're so sick of that. But uh, three years ago, I uh, mentioned in closing my grandmother Hockenberry, who was uh, at, that, at that time 100 years old, 99 years old, 99 or 100 years old. She was just about to turn 100 years old. And we would always ask her when we were growing up, God, Grandma, you, you were raised during time of horses and then there were cars and airplanes and so much has changed in your life. What do you think about that? What do you say about that? And, you know, her answer was always the same. It was, well, you know, airplanes and cars were big and then pretty much since then, you, you know, my children or my grandchildren or neighbors have been coming to me. Young people have been coming to me saying, hey, look at this. And she'd go, that's nice. And, and that would be it. So it, from her perspective, nothing really had changed after cars and airplanes. Well, Last week, exactly a week ago, my grandmother died at age 102. And she lived in three centuries. Born in the 1800s, lived throughout the 1900s, and died this year, year 2000. And you can quibble about the numerical significance of which is in what century. But nevertheless, when we go to bury Grandma Hockenberry, Beatrice Hockenberry, there's a gravestone in Dayton, Ohio, where her husband, who died in the 1960s is, and next to his grave is her grave, and on there is in that gravestone in 19. So you call up the, uh, the monument folks. <laughs> My grandmother dies and you're fucking laughing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And they laugh at dead grandmothers too, these dead people. What's going on? So we call up the monument people and we say, so what, what, what do we do? I mean, what, what's going to happen here? I mean, you know, she died in 2000. I mean, we don't want to leave. I mean, I, I, what's your plan for this? And they say, well, we really don't have a plan. This is happening, you know, more and more. We, we didn't really anticipate this sort of thing. But 
we can, uh, you know, the only thing that's really going to work is we pull out the gravestone and give you another one. Um, and of course, it'll be great because that's, you know, it, it'll be exactly as though there was no aging or weathering or time going by or, or anything like that. And, and it'll have the, your grandfather and your grandmother together. And that costs this amount, which of course is an extraordinary, outrageous amount of money. I said, well, what else would you do? I mean, isn't there a way to kind of, you know, just change the number? And he said, well, we can. We can do a kind of a, you know, a engraving thing. We can get in there, put a little, uh, you know, caulking kind of stuff, and then put a 2,000 on there. You know, it's going to look different. It's going to look not like her husband, you know, and that'll cost this amount. Okay. Fine. And I said, well, wh what if you just, which I actually thought was the most beautiful solution, what, what if you just crossed out the 19 and put a 2,000? <laughs> which indeed represents the extraordinary feat of living in three centuries and how we don't believe such a thing could occur, but it did occur and it happened in our lifetime and we were wrong about that and she was right and she was 102. And I said, you know, could you do that? He said, yeah, we'll do that for nothing. <laughs> so the theme today, the point today, and there's so much to talk about, and uh, so little time, is it's the illusion that costs money in this technologi technological deal here. It's often the truth that costs nothing. It's often the truth that is the simplest, that is closest to us. And let me, let me illustrate a couple of things. Um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, bipedality lately. You know, as someone with a couple of peds here uh, that have been in a state of uh, sort of advanced obsolescence for about 23 years, uh, you know, I don't have much of a sense of bipedality as you all do. But what is that experience? Because there was a moment in human history where uh, the human species, whatever it was at that time, went from hanging around on all fours to going up to two legs. I don't know if you know much about human physiology, but there is virtually no evidence in human physiology. There's nothing intuitive at all about the way human beings are constructed to suggest that bipedality would happen. Our circulatory system is not created to pump blood from the feet. Uh, and there's a kind of a, a cob job, sort of botch upgrade kind of thing in the venous system where we have uh, valves that prevent the, the blood from actually going down to our feet. And that was something that did evolve since bipedality. But there's no sort of innate engineering sense of of uh, being bipedal. So bipedality is the first technological experience of the human species. It's basically taking a non-intuitive set of, situa of circumstances, of, of materials, and constructing from that a radically new solution that totally transforms everything that comes after that. One of the reasons I'm thinking about bipedality is these two little girls within the last six months, Zoe and Olivia, Zoe who has a slightly terrified expression about being next to that little playground toy, and Olivia, uh, who's a little more joyful and accepting of bizarre playground toys, but both of them learned at about the same time, within about a two-week period of each other, how to walk. They basically intuited the notion and looked at mommy walking around. They certainly didn't get it from daddy. You know. I mean, you can imagine them sitting there just going, well, where's our chair? You know. But no, they didn't do that. They constructed a technological breakthrough within their own bodies. And believe me, when you see a little child learning to walk, they are constantly faced with the fact that this is not going to work. You know. <laughs> this is absurd. You know. I mean, I don't know what she's doing, looking at mommy there, but this is not working for me. But when it happens, all of life changes. All of life changes. So I think we can date the original technological moment from that moment of bipedality. And in looking at that, observing my girls, feeling my own experience, it's an extraordinary reminder that technology consists of those kinds of moments. Those are technological moments where, as Danny Hillis points out, it doesn't quite work. The implications have not been worked out. We don't know what the implications are, but unfortunately in our society, we tend to confuse the implications with the technology. Hypocrisy. You all know what this means now. <laughs> the reason that that's funny is because that's exactly where we live today. That's, that's not like a stretch at all. 
I mean, since the Kennedy years, we have replaced shareholder value as a way of making social change over political values. We've devalued political values. People barely vote, but they're in the market. If you're a shareholder, if you're an investor, you know, you've got your own channel. It's called CNBC. You're like, you're doing stuff. You're changing. You're a part of the future. You're a part of this uh, change that's taking place, and you hear the CEOs talk about it. If you're a voter, if you're an activist, you know, you can see yourself as like the weird parents on Dharma and Greg or something. <laughs> We devalue that sort of role in producing social change. And so while John Doerr makes a profound argument for the private sector helping to solve our educational problems, he's also admitting that the American Revolution has failed. The very system that we have here in the United States is set up to insist that political values exceed the value of shareholder values. Shareholders are not permitted to make social change in the way that political values, political shareholders are permitted. And this is a process that happens in our technological lives all the time. The, the extraordinary revolution takes place, whether we're talking about the American Revolution, whether we're talking about bipedality, whatever we're talking about, and then the market seeks to work its will on the implications. And so let's talk about you know, what we assume is the high-tech economy. Uh, virtual reality, with all due respect to Mr. Lanier, was created by the Catholic Church, um, <laughs> refined by the French aristocracy, um, worked out during the Industrial Revolution, and till today, we're, we have all sorts of virtual, I mean, Stalin actually helped with virtual reality. Um, <laughs> You know, down through history, it's full of situations where uh, enormous institutions are telling people that they basically need an upgrade, or a couple of upgrades, or in the case of the Holocaust, you know, a really big upgrade. <laughs> but seriously, what happens when technology transforms the world? <clears throat> institutions seek to narrow the options of the people for whom the implications seem infinite and barely understandable. And once those options are narrowed, we then supply people with the illusion that they have control over those options. Priceline. Let's take an example of Priceline. Tremendously successful. Um, this has nothing to do with Priceline. Um, tremendously successful business model. And the premise of which is you go on Priceline, you get a plane ticket, and you know what? That plane ticket was cheaper than any plane ticket you could have got anywhere else. And of course, who's telling you that? Well, Priceline is telling you that. <laughs> and you believe it, right? <clears throat> the illusion of control. You know, I mean, the first website that was created was this one here. In my day, it was called a busy box. Graphically, uh, very exciting. It has all kinds of uh, things that you can do. <laughs> Gives you the illusion of control. And through things like this, we train children that, in fact, you're going to be given a lot of opportunities to have the illusion of control over variables that have been set. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Um, by institutions that you had nothing to do with. I'll just leave this here on stage in case any of you would like to come and take a look at it. <laughs> And then, of course, there are more refined illusions like this play school cell phone car kind of thing here. You know, the interesting thing is that my kids, they get sent these, or, you know, people give them, and my kids, like, throw them away. They just say, they prefer the much better illusion that is supplied by using the actual cell phone. <laughs> it's a much better illusion uh, of no control. <laughs> the illusion of control. So, You'll notice that uh, there's another chair up here that kind of snuck up here while you weren't looking. I hope that it's on. It's there. This is God here. Uh, there we go. Um, 
What I would like to do is recreate for you the original moment of human technology, the moment of bipedality. This is a moment that I had not experienced for 20 years until I met up with this wacko here. And indeed, the uh, feeling that I had was one of liberation in my own you know, acoustic wheelchair, let's say. Okay, you can pull that back. Uh, and I felt that these things were kind of, uh, you know, the illusion of control. They certainly required less effort, you know. If anything, I need more effort than less effort these days. Um, but uh, it didn't seem like anything I would want. I mean, it's electric. It moves around. Now, this is a chair that goes upstairs. You may not be able to immediately see why that is the case. And of course, the motivation for making this chair is, is all about being able to go upstairs. But what this chair does that is profound is uh, recreate the moment of bipedality, a non-intuitive, physiological, technological issue that transformed a body that had no sense that it could balance on two points into a body that can. So. Uh, We go up a little, still on two wheels. I sat in this chair about uh, a year ago. And I thought to myself, what is it like to walk? And I would have sort of literary descriptions of that, but I could never really articulate it. And I think the articulation of that comes in this issue of what we're talking about the technological moment that's real versus that illusion of control that characterizes much of the high-tech industry that we deal with these days. On the Super Bowl, there was an ad, which many of you may have saw, seen, in which a, a tax-free municipal bond company by the name of Nuveen paid Christopher Reeve an estimated $1 million and some graphic designers probably a million dollars, and then of course paid uh, NFL and, and uh, ABC television about three million dollars to run an ad which showed Christopher Reeve standing up and walking. An extraordinary use of high technology to make an emotional point which has absolutely nothing to do, that I can see, with tax-free municipal bonds. <laughs> Perhaps you can see it. All oh, right, gotta lean back. Jesus, such a dork. Physics is just a good idea. It's the law. Now, that was an illusion, but this is real. And in fact, what you have here is a device that allows me to have my hands free for the first time in 20 years. And I want you to know that um, that this feels like walking. I'm balanced up here. I'm floating on the same forces that keep your toes, torso above your hips, your hips above your knees, and my hands are free. And from these hands comes forth all of the technology that we've talked about today. It seems to me when we think about the humanity and the notions of maintaining that humanity in the work that we do, we need to understand that there are those technological moments like this, and there are those that are all about illusion and the narrowing of options for people, and then betting on how those options come out in the mass market. The solution to the problem of this telethon is knowing the difference. Thank you very much.
allow me to introduce Steve Kamen, the inventor of the Johnson & Johnson iBot Personal Transporter. vulnerability thing again. It works. This will be one of the, you know, the Ted Teary moments probably when I describe this and then show you something and then Dean will talk for a few minutes. But um, Dean uh, called me on the phone this year. Stay up here for a few minutes. Dean called me on the phone uh, this year and said, watch uh, Dateline. Um, the next night or something. I said, why? He said, I can't tell you because something's going to be shown for the first time. And I can't tell you. I mean, he could have told me for, well, who's I going to call? <laughs> <laughs> Big secret thing. So, you know, I guess maybe that was the way of getting me to watch it. You have friends at Dateline. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, watched it. And uh, my, my, Gloria and I watched it. And we both were just sobbing. So I'm going to put on the piece. Uh, can you put on the whole piece right from the very beginning? I know I started it late, but just put it right from the beginning and put on the piece from uh, Dateline. It's one of the most moving pieces. And it was John and Dean and some other people. And it was the introduction on television of this chair. I know some of you have seen it, but it's amazing. And uh, let's roll that if we can. For the past six years since the car accident that left her paralyzed, 24-year-old Tammy Wilbur has lived in a new world. A world that wasn't made for wheelchairs. Even near her home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, there are obstacles galore. Sometimes the only way to get from here to there is to risk the open road. Tammy is down below the world of walking people. Where most people make eye contact, Tammy sees belts and doorknobs. And much of the world is simply out of her reach. Even her kitchen cabinets, too high. It's frustrating because um, before when I could walk, it was just, I can go, come, and do as I pleased. Tammy isn't complaining, really. It's just that often her wheelchair reminds her of the places she really wishes she could go, but can't. A walk in the woods, a stroll on the beach. The beach is just a great place to be. I can go and stare at it from a distance, but I can't get close to it. Wheelchairs can get you around, but as Tammy says, they don't get close enough to the places disabled people might like to go. You've heard the expression, confined to a wheelchair? Well, actually, if you think about it, it's the wheelchairs that are confined to the relatively few smooth rolling places in the world. But what if somebody came up with a device that, as they say, could go where no wheelchairs have gone before? It would take someone on a mission someone with the money and genius and time to put into the project. It would take someone like Dean Kamen. I like big machines. I like the physics. I like the engineering of these things. He's one of this nation's most prestigious inventors. He's a sort of Thomas Edison in the medical world. Among Kamen's inventions is a portable kidney dialysis machine. His early ideas made him millions, but money is not what drives Dean Kamen. I don't work on a project unless I believe that it will dramatically improve life for a bunch of people. Nine years ago, Kamen wanted to improve the life of a young man he happened to see struggling to get his wheelchair up a curb. I just fixated on how unreasonable that condition really is. And it just seemed to me that the fundamental issue was the world has not been architected for people that are sitting down at 39 inches. Kamen thought about this old problem in a revolutionary new way. What if instead of getting a chair to go upstairs, you could make a machine that could stand up and balance the way humans do? Your mother remembers your first steps. It's a big deal that humans walk erect. It's difficult to do, but once we've learned to do it, we're capable of dealing with curbs in a world with stairs. Kamen and his engineers came up with a two-wheeled balancing prototype that worked. 
It became this top secret patented invention, crammed full of sophisticated gyroscopes, electric motors, and computers. Cayman allowed Dateline an exclusive peek at it. To our surprise, Cayman's machine was actually more compact and narrower than a traditional wheelchair. So this looks like a fairly normal power wheelchair. It seems to have slightly different wheels. If you were on the street in this, people would think, oh, it's just one of those power wheelchairs. John, I have to tell you, this is not a wheelchair. This is an extraordinary machine. So what is this extraordinary machine capable of doing? Cayman was happy to demonstrate here on his own obstacle course, full of all kinds of wheelchair nightmares, like this pretty basic one, a standard curb. If I had to go over the curb, this is how I would do it. Now, of course, I had to be a hot shot. But this isn't a practical thing to do with, say, a bag of groceries in my lap or a small child. They'd go flying. So anyone sitting in that chair sees an eight-inch curb, what do they do? I would just do what normal people do. I'd kind of walk up the curb. And you notice, I stayed completely level. And now I want to come off the curb. Now my wheels will adjust, but my seat stays completely level here as I come down the curb. Not bad, but here's a tougher problem. High shelves in the grocery store that can make shopping difficult for people in wheelchairs. Now I can reach the baby powder, but to get that honeycomb down, I need to sort of use the graham crackers to kind of... That's how I would handle that. All right. How do you do that? Well, I might just decide it's time to stand up. Time to stand up? I would tip myself. Is he nuts? He's sitting in a chair. And I would stand up. When Dean came and says he's going to stand up, Again, believe him. The four wheels on the ground suddenly like and shockingly became two wheels, just standing there. And then, now that I'm nice and tall and I've raised my seat up, I would just come over here and get the honeycombs and hand Thanks. them to a friend in need. Thanks a lot. How does this do this on wheels? Balance is sort of fundamental to the way we all get around. It looks like this it could fall over, but it won't. Throw a 25-pound bag of lead at Cayman. No problem. And the machine compensates my, my like a champ. Cayman says his machine's computer brain has a quicker reaction time than a human being. As Cayman predicted, solving this balance problem was in fact the key to solving everything else. Like stairs. The big test. I approach these stairs, I'm looking really for somebody to haul me up the stairs. Now you see these stairs, what happens? Well, I want to go up those stairs, I'm going to change into a mode which we call stair mode. So you really, you, you literally hit stair climb yep, mode? I have a little icon that we built onto this device. I will tip myself back just a little bit and now grab the rails. If I lean back a little bit, the wheels will come over the top from one stair to the other. I can come up a little ways. And by stopping here, I can stop. These Are wheels. you pulling the chair up the stairs? No. I'm just, if I lean back, I come up. If I lean forward, I come down. How fast can you get from there to the top? Let's say you were in kind of a hurry to get upstairs and grab something. You might think it's hard to top climbing stairs. But check out what the machine can do on really rough terrain. I bet you you won't be able to get completely into it, never mind out of it. So I'll drop down in there and I won't be able to move it. That's what I That's believe. what you think? I think you're wrong about that. All right. And I think you're done. All right, I can kind of inch along by doing this. So I beat your threshold. You did. Let's you just beat, notice you, that, you all right? So, but this, <laughs> and I'm here pretty much till the tide comes up. How far is Whizboy going to get now? Well, as you see, I'm going to drive in. I'll come over the curb, keeping my balance as always. Now all four wheels will drive, and if I want to move, I just go. It's like you're not even in sand. And. If I happen to want to climb out of the sand, I will just climb out. If I want to go into gravel, 
You win. <laughs> What's exciting about this device is not the technology. It's the choices. That you could go from point A to point B any way you want. And this isn't some exotic experiment on a device that no one is ever going to see. The builders of this machine intend that it's going to be used out in the world. And soon. In order to bring his invention to the mass market, Cayman needed the help of a company with considerable resources. So he got in touch with the Johnson & Johnson Corporation. Dr. Robert Gussin is the company's vice president of technology. How long, best guess, before this could actually be seen on the market? We think within 18 to 24 months. It's got to go through a rigorous FDA clearance procedure. That's right, the Food and Drug Administration. Because a wheelchair is a medical device, it has to be tested more like a drug than like, say, a bicycle or a lawnmower. With the idea that virtually any failure could be catastrophic, Cayman's engineers have rocked, rolled, bounced, drowned, and pounded their new machine. But the ultimate test is when actual people try out Cayman's sophisticated new invention. How are you? Good, how are you? Very well. So Dateline invited Tammy Wilbur and her mother and sister in to have a look. Oh my God. Oh my God. For Tammy, it was a trip back to a world she hadn't known since her car accident six years ago. Steady on the stick and up she'll go. Where she could hop some curbs, climb some stairs. That's it, that's it, that's oh, it. Baby. Perfect. That's <laughs> For Tammy's family, it was like watching her take her first steps all over again. And for Tammy's mom, she was able to look her daughter right in the eyes. <laughs> I know it's bend over. I know. What they all discovered is what Cayman discovered. That standing up is a big deal. A really big deal. <laughs> I haven't felt like this for a long time. Just tall. It's a different feeling, always being short. I didn't know I was going to have this kind of reaction. Can Dean Kamen's new device change the world? Nobody knows until the FDA approves it for use outside of the lab and beyond the inventor's no. own property. <laughs> but one thing is certain, the emotional impact can already be felt. It gave Tammy a chance to do what she missed the most, take a walk in the woods and a stroll on the beach. Experiences that have no price, with parameters that can never be measured by engineers. <laughs> Brace yourself for the price. Dean Kamen's invention will cost about $20,000 when it becomes available to the public. But because it could spare the expense of customizing homes with ramps and wider doorways and mechanical lifts in cars, the money spent could be offset in money saved. people cried. You asked that for Brokaw. I'm so glad you asked it for me. I'm so glad. <laughs> it's an important question. Yes. Obviously, every year he does something, you know. Uh, last few years, as you know, at least last year he talked about the amazing thing, which you've all heard, the first project. We all know about that. If you don't know about that, I'm going to give him all your addresses and he'll send you one of these things on this the most amazing contest to make for the kids in schools. You saw hundreds of corporations backing teams in high schools across the country. Uh, 
he is quite an amazing, amazing person. Um, and, I, and to bring it back home, it, it is about teaching kids to know that difference yeah. that we talked about earlier Absolutely. between manipulation and true technological innovation. Since he isn't over 70 or under 30. Uh, but owns a BMW. Uh, <laughs> but in two, in two years, the story that I'd love him to tell is a story he told me over lunch one day in Charleston, which is a story of his youth and going to high school and his own labs at home. And when he sent his mother and father, father, both teachers out in Long Island, I remember this. You haven't told me this. It was a number of years ago. Remember? See what I remember? So you don't think I listened to you. <laughs> he made money doing some wild inventive things, and he was hiring people to work on it. And the shop in the basement wasn't big enough, so he saved his money, sent his mother and father away on a cruise. They went away. He dug up with his uncle who was a contractor, did they, they, while they were away, they had trucks come dig up the backyard <laughs> and extend the basement out in the backyard and then put the backyard back so his parents would know. <laughs> and had this huge shop where he employed half the high school working on his projects when he was in high school. That's close proximity to the story, isn't it? Anyway, he has to tell that story sometime because I sat there with my mouth open. Has he ever told you this story? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Dean, what a pleasure. And that's amazing. And Thank this you. is amazing. And uh, what else can I say? It's a great moment, great time between Danny, you. I was, I was in, in June, I was in, I, was in uh, I forget where, San Jose or someplace. And these two were talking, at, you know, Danny and Dean. And they're talking about, I, they're talking about very common things, how you work certain kinds of metal. I didn't even know the metals they were talking about. I mean, very simple, just, uh, that was an amazing kind. Remember that conversation? Okay. Okay, that's it. Out of here. Out of here. Can I, can I make a You can make, you can say minute, whatever, absolutely. Two minute update on absolutely, where we are? Absolutely, two minute update. I want to use Danny Hillis two minutes. Not, I want, I'd like to use his two minutes, not a web two minutes though, but. Uh, I'm in the same position that, that, that Danny's in. I know some of you I told about this last year, and some of you don't know anything, and without a context, it won't make any sense. One of the reasons I'm glad that Mr. Werman showed that. Mr. Werman? Richard. Okay, just go ahead, you're taking time doing that. <laughs> Mr. Werman. Showed that tape is because I think you can see that in about seven or eight minutes, people that know what they're doing with television can tell a whole story and they can do it visually and, and, and graphically. And to me, uh, if there was one thing I could get from the people in, in your industry, entertainment, and as it applies to technology, it's some help telling a slightly different story. And it's only a slightly different story of, of first. Um, since I can't give you too much of the background, I'm just watching over the last couple of days people approaching this problem from different angles. Mr. Milken pointing out, of course, that every kid's now worth about a half a million dollars if they've gotten the intellect. And Mr. Doerr pointing out the economic reality of the world and 40 million kids can't read. Everybody's been approaching that problem in our culture, I think, from the supply side, whether it's charter schools or money here or money there. And about eight or nine years ago, I asked a whole bunch of big companies to create a cultural change, help create using the Hollywood establishment a cultural change in this country that'll create some of the right heroes because in America you get what you celebrate and we celebrate the wrong damn things and we do it very well and I just thought that that if we could get them to celebrate engineering and science and thinking and you know who knows and you know colleges could compete in something besides ice hockey and and so I told you what had happened in an event that we started with 17 teams in last year, just to bring you up to where we were by last year, after the first five years, we were too big for any high school gyms. We went down to Disneyland. We got them to host a regional version or national version of our annual event. And we had by last year, which is by this eighth year, had seven regional events in seven cities and about 200 teams. Since then, and I read you a letter about a whole community that had been changed by this event. Uh, was a school in, in uh, Cleveland. 
So now just the update from last year to this year. Uh, we're still growing at a compound rate of about 55%. Uh, we went from 200 and some odd teams to just under 400 teams for this year's event. We went from seven regionals in seven different cities around the country, all of which will start next month. Every year we give out the kits in January. These kids working with big companies around the country, and some little companies, spend seven, eight weeks learning what it's like to be creative, to think, to be analytic, to produce something they can be proud of. Well, the four weeks of our regional start in about two weeks, there are 10 of them. And one of them this year will be in San Jose. And uh, I'd encourage all of you to get there. And the story I can tell you this year, I don't have another letter like the one I read last year about what happened to that school, but it's like the truth is better than fiction. Uh, thanks, in fact, to some of the connections we made here last year, we got some great support. And in fact, we, as I said, had uh, a team come from San Jose. It was sponsored by a small engineering organization called NASA. And, uh, and they adopted, as we encourage everybody to do, a really tough school to win the Chairman's Award. And the school, in fact, they adopted in, believe it or not, San Jose, where we heard that you create all the wealth in the, in the world. Um, the school they adopted was an alternative school, which is a euphemism. Uh, there are about 60 kids in this school, all on parole. Almost all the girls in this school have at least one child. Many of these kids have been or are drug users. They adopt this school, and they start working with these kids last January. And by the end of the six weeks, the LA Times does a newspaper story. I can give you guys a copy of it, in which they show an interview with a kid who shows up at the regional events. Only six weeks has gone by in this kid's life, and his arm's in, in a sling. He's bandaged up, and the reason it is is because he had been a gang leader. And uh, the day before the event, he decided he couldn't go with all his gang tattoos, so he went to a hospital and had them burned out of his arm. So he shows up. The LA Times does it. Dan Golden, the administrator, and NASA meets the kid. He assures that they're going to be very supportive in the coming year. We have all sorts of data which will happily give you that every single kid in this alternative school has been on this team. They're turned around. Their, their GPAs are, have gone from a fraction of one up to they're the best kids. In fact, they're so good, they're being, this part I didn't know until literally the night before last when we flew out here, they're putting them into other schools around San Jose. I fly in to come to this meeting. I say, hey, we're in San Jose. We got to go see this Steve Lugo kid and the teacher. So we drive up there, and the teacher that was involved, the parole officer of this kid, meets us and says, look at this video. And he shows us a video that these, quote, gang kids took from inside a school, literally a few days ago, watching this school being torn down. Uh, the kids are being told they're now being moved off to other schools. The teacher, of course, didn't want to see this happen to this school. And remember, this is gang kids. These are kids that don't make it. Also videoed the following event, and we can give you copies of it. it it's also made your local newspaper, I guess, a couple of days ago. This kid went to the school board and tells the school board at one of their meetings, don't tear down our school. These are kids that never wanted to go to school. And oh, by the way, I will not go to any of these other schools unless you assure me that they'll have a first team. And one of the guys on the school board says, what the hell is the first team? And he explains it and then says, by the way, I can give you the names of students you have in some of your good schools that are working hard to get expelled to come to our bad school <laughs> so, so they can be in a good program. Well, the teacher and the student, who seem to be fairly effective, uh, are making use of this. I went with the teacher the night before last to visit the superintendent of schools of San Jose and said, why don't we turn this lemon into some lemonade here and to get these kids to go off to the schools that you want and to improve those schools uh, and to make your school district look like the leader it ought to be, why don't you just commit to have every high school in San Jose have a team and then this problem will be self-extinguishing. And we're currently working on that. We could use a little help, of course, uh, from some companies to adopt some of these schools uh, I'm sure I'm over. I'll shut up. But I can tell you 
that our culture really is dominated by business. That's what makes America great. It always has been. But at least in the last generation or so, it's been effectively dominated by the media, particularly entertainment. And this place, the reason I come out here each year I've been invited is there's so much low-hanging fruit in this room <laughs> to, help, to help fix this. Because if the entertainment industry will help popularize what we're doing, if they can do with a show what John Hockenberry could do with this, I know Noah Wiley's here. I met him at last year's, thank you very much, meeting. He is here. Now, I'd never want to embarrass him, but he's sitting here somewhere, and I can tell you that he's agreed uh, to play the lead role of one of the engineers if they do a movie about first, which will popularize it. Some of the companies that I met out here have agreed to participate in that. But we've got to create demand among these kids to leverage <coughs> the $600 billion you're already spending on education, whether you spend it in a charter school, whether you spend it in a home, when, no matter where you spend it, you've got to change kids when they're still young so that they understand how important it is uh, to develop their mind and to be smart and to be productive. You've heard different people from milk and to door to point out it's good business, it's self-enlightened, <coughs> let's do it and, and help me. So, that's it. Can you go down? You want to go down the stairs? Can you go? Should I go down the stairs? Go down the stairs. Why not? I'll get down. Here, the, the, I'll push this. This is better. gentlemen it is five of five I need your help I need speaker support I need your indulgence and patience you know I try to run this 